Hello, everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of Vital Spark, a Spark biomedical podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Litwin, the voice of B2B. We're here at a beautiful day in studio, and we're excited to be bringing you the first episode of our show, where at large, we're going to be exploring uh, various topics. But more importantly, and more specifically, we're going to be exploring alternatives to treating opioid addiction and withdrawal. We're going to be chatting and discussing the larger issues surrounding addiction, how it impacts care systems from patients, obviously, to physicians as well, and where cutting-edge technology and methodologies will play a critical role in finding solutions to this persisting crisis. That's a big picture view. We're going to get more specific to today on the podcast on what our listeners can expect from the show, and then we'll also get into the meat of today's episode. But before we do that, make sure you're heading to our website, sparkbiomedical.com. Again, Spark biomedical.com, as well as subscribing to Vital Spark on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Just hit uh, that subscribe button, and you'll have a full catalog of previous conversations plus notifications when we drop new ones. And for all the video episodes, you'll want to head to our website. So folks, on our first episode of the show, we're going to be covering several topics, but mainly we're wanting to get you acquainted with how Spark Biomedical fits into the larger narrative of opioid addiction treatment by pulling from our internal expertise to get an update on the state of the addiction crisis, the process for developing an innovative technology for addiction treatment, and how our podcast will help foster some necessary discussions around tackling the crisis and moving key aspects of those solutions forward. So just for a little context here, the last two years have been a catastrophe, to put it lightly, uh, for addiction-related issues. The National Center for Health Statistics reported that from the period between April of 2020 to April of 2021, so a one-year period, more than 100,000 Americans died from a drug-related overdose. And that's actually a 30% increase, and a total that represents more fatalities than car crashes and gun violence combined, right? So this is a major issue. And individual states, too, are seeing opioid-specific overdose rates increase as well, with the CDC correlating a lot of that to the increased availability and president, uh, excuse me, presence of fentanyl in various drugs. So with our first episode, again, what we're wanting to do is get that high-level view of the crisis, as well as some granular insights on developing said innovative technical solution. And to do so, we're going to be welcoming one of the three founders of Spark Biomedical. He's been in the medical device and neuromodulation field for 15 plus years, and more specifically in the areas of implantable devices for Parkinson's tremor relief and epilepsy therapy. So let's go ahead and welcome my Daniel partner in crime here, Mr. Daniel Powell, CEO of Spark Biomedical. Dan, great to have you on. How are you doing? Uh, thank you very much. Glad to be here. Yeah, real pleasure getting to pull from your expertise and your leadership at Spark Biomedical. So let's go ahead and cut right to the chase. Um, I'll get your thoughts here on some of the stats that I laid out, but uh, I guess at at large, right, I, I want to first get your perspective on how this conversation and this podcast will play a role in moving necessary discussions forward. So your podcast and, more importantly, your solutions touch on this persisting issue in our nation, the opioid crisis. So what conversations do you think the care industry needs to have today to uh, really move tackling this crisis forward? And how does this podcast play a role in fostering some of those conversations, in your view? Uh, those are good questions, and it's great to be here and actually see Vital Spark off the ground. This is an oh, yeah. idea we've had for a while. Um, you know, the conversations are difficult because there is something we're calling a treatment desert out there. There is more people who need help that do not have the insurance to pay for it, that do not have quality facilities or treatment centers near them, and that largely feel lost in, in, in the system. And you double that with... Um, all drugs getting laced now to some degree with fentanyl, so that where it was just uh, uh, something that was affecting heroin, it's now sneaking its way into meth and cocaine and all these other drugs that would have been deemed safer. Um, it's, it's really, um, it's a conversation that needs to be about compassion uh, and helping people, not stigmatizing uh, the disease, but, but really recognizing that we're in a huge crisis, and it is... It's been devastating communities for 20 years, uh, but just what's going on in the last three years is insane. I'll give you a little example. Yeah. So I started this company in 2018, and 
uh, I was doing the, the PowerPoint deck where you explain how big the problem is and market size. And the number of opioid-specific overdose deaths was 42,000. And so I'm pitching to the first investors, and I'm like, that's a Vietnam War worth of overdose deaths every year. So it's like we're, we're having a Vietnam War every year. Behind the scenes, me and my partners are like, I mean, I think we might have missed the peak of this epidemic. Like, we were thinking we were like, it should, everybody knows the awareness is here. And then it just kept going up and going up. And so the number, a, a little different number than you read yeah. out, was 79,000, uh, 69,710 overdose deaths in 2020 compared to 2017. So in the three years oh, yeah. I've been working on this product, it's gone up 40%. And it's just, it's, Brutal. And it's switched from being a pill mill problem, Oxycontin. Uh, everybody's probably got a chance to watch Dope Sick on Hulu, which is a fantastic depiction of what went down in this country over the last 20 years. Mm. Um, to we're in kind of what's called the third wave of this opioid epidemic. So the first wave was um, pills, right. uh, pain pills. The second wave was as people, as the rules around pain pills started to tighten and we closed down the pill mills, everybody went to heroin because the withdrawal is so painful and so primal instinct of fear that you start to make the willing switch where somebody, you're just like, look, I was just a normal citizen. I don't have a moral failing, but the withdrawal is so bad, so they switched to, to heroin. And now the third wave is the switch to fentanyl. Yeah, and I mean, that progression is heavy. Uh, yeah, and it's clearly having, uh, you know, like a, a tangible impact on not only our care systems, but also just, you know, I don't know, not to get too existential, but the fabric of society, right? I mean, like these are issues that persist and disrupt communities, and especially in those communities that have treatment deserts, uh, often more rural communities, poorer communities, socioeconomically disadvantaged communities, you stack that up with other existing issues and you just get a domino effect of blasting challenges. It's brutal. The number of orphans yeah. in, uh, lost either one or both parents in like West Virginia where this was really ground zero. Right. It's devastating. Those communities, you know, they're, they won't come back in a generation or two. It's, it's a long time. Exactly. So then tying it back to the podcast and the conversations we hope to have on the show, uh, what's your goal for the kind of perspectives and education you hope to communicate on the show? Maybe more specifically, who are the kinds of professionals or experts you plan to bring on to help connect the dots between the big picture, the impacts, and potential solutions? Yeah, first off, we want to provide education. Uh, resources for families, people going through addiction, trying to pursue recovery, and so that they get facts that are, are not spun or that are not sensationalized uh, from a media perspective, but really help them figure out what the next step is. So I'd like to see addiction professionals uh, on here talk about treatment, talk about the intersection of pain and addiction, which is a huge thing. Uh, but one of the th items that I really hope to highlight as we come out of this is hope. Yeah. Uh, and it, the hope isn't just because Spark happens to have a, a novel product that we do intend to change the world with, but hope that there's treatment centers out there that can take care of you, that there is innovation on the way beyond what Spark's working on. And, and then maybe lastly, uh, teach compassion for those who are not in this. And I, I have to speak from a personal experience. I grew up one of those people who believed that addiction was a moral failing, you know. Uh, I remember I remember the potheads over at the Sonic, you know, and this is like 1977, <laughs> oh, okay. Those, those so, crazy kids. Yeah, I know, yeah. you know, the least of our offenders today. Yeah. Um, and I remember growing up with that mindset, and then I, I'm coming into this from a neuroscience, neurotech background, and I had to become sensitive to the plight of people suffering from uh, opioid use disorder not calling them addicts, don't label them. I used to work in epilepsy and you didn't call someone an epileptic. You said they lived with epilepsy. You know, you don't label someone on their disease. And so teaching, sharing that perspective and really understanding that addiction normally is coming from a place of trauma and normally is coming from a place of someone trying to heal but not having the right resources, so they're coping and, um, and 
not to make a long answer long, but <laughs> sure. th- th- my my personal journey was, you know, I have a nephew who suffered from addiction, and I never talked to my brother about it, and we just didn't talk about it, and we kept it all quiet, and he went to prison, and we didn't talk about it, and when I started working on this, I called my brother one day, and I said, you know, for the first time, what's it been like? And we had a real honest conversation as brothers that we should have had before. So um, I think taking away the stigma and and then what's amazing, my nephew is in recovery and uh, just at Thanksgiving, he and I were talking and just got to talk about his life and his journey and he wants to give back and help people now. And it's there is a human there, right? Uh, which Which gets you know, get stripped away by a lot of the outside world who just judge it. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, the fact that it's that strong of a stigma that it affected even, you know, like your relationship with your brother, right? Like that, I think, is a perfect example of how much even, you know, the best intentions, there still has to be a sort of an unlearning process and a refocus on how do we talk about this issue, like at a, at a base level, and I think that allows for, uh, you know, and hopefully what this podcast is going to help foster too is an intersection of the big dots, right? Where we talk solutions, we talk, um, you know, the ethos behind being more thoughtful and compassionate as a care industry around this topic, and even you know the structural dynamics that create some of these issues in the first place. And I'm looking forward to being part of those conversations with y'all moving forward. So, last, uh, I guess, big picture thing before we get more specific on Spark Biomedical's um, technology and innovative solution here. Uh, you know, I mentioned in my intro, and you help follow up with some more stats on. Uh, I guess a more recent update to the nation's opioid crisis. But I'm wondering if you can uh, just drill into the COVID impact here. Um, You know, I think, uh, to your point, there is public conversation around this. Our society collectively has been analyzing some of the various touch points that exacerbate this crisis and who bears responsibility, Um, you know, whether that's a pharmaceutical company or even a a local pharmacy or anything in between, right? Where do you pinpoint a, a fault in a system or a methodology and how do you solve it, uh, a big part of that is naturally COVID and the way that it accelerated some of those dynamics of treatment deserts uh, and then just uh, reasons to get addicted in the first place. So I'm curious what you see as the intersection there between the pandemic and this crisis. You know, I saw today an article that says um, addiction is a disease of isolation. Mm. Traditional 12, there's traditional 12-step programs uh, but there's also cognitive behavioral therapy and, and future painting uh, of, of what you want your life to be. Um, and this will all come home. So one of the best ways to overcome addiction is not to think, I shouldn't use, I shouldn't use, I shouldn't use. Those, the way the neuropsyche works, the neuroscience of your brain that just pushes the first domino over and you will eventually fail. You, you don't have the willpower to resist a long, long, long time. The better way is to picture what you want your life to be and what you don't want your life to be like. And I, I heard that in my, my nephew's voice. He's like, I don't like that life. And when I want to use, I think, no, I, I want to get a job. He wants to be a barber. He wants to have a career. And, and so you take all that and then you stick someone in their home because there's a disease and you're watching the little tally on CNN tell you how many people are dying every day. Right. And you take away their community and their familiar structure and their hope for a job and income, and it is the perfect storm for relapse. And it's a perfect storm just to start doing drugs to begin with. I mean, you're just miserable and you're losing hope and you're isolated. So it is the worst thing that could have happened at a time when this country already had this diabolical drug readily available. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like the perfect storm of these two issues compounding. They are. You almost, yeah. could, you almost couldn't think <clears throat> of, a, of a worse scenario to exacerbate the crisis. Uh, so I, it's great that there are innovative solutions in market now that are helping make that journey to recovery easier. And hopefully with the podcast too, we can help identify some of those, um, you know, those larger trends or those uh, those motivators that create the scenarios that lead to addiction. Uh, so, you know, 
I, I hear this a lot in my medical conversations with other professionals, but uh, you know, a healthy body, healthy mind and everything is as much reactive as it is proactive, right? And treatment is one thing, but building the education to build a more thoughtful community around it is, is another. And uh, it's all part of the same vision, I think. And I, I'm, it feels like you share. You share Absolutely. that perspective, yeah. So let's go ahead and jump in then to Spark Biomedical's intersection to this conversation and to the industry and the crisis at large. So with all of this in mind, can you tell me how you and the company landed on a withdrawal treatment therapy solution as your first product, right? You know, you saw this crisis. Why this as the solution you wanted to give a shot? Yeah. Um, so, and... and I'll frame it around, uh, we are a, a neurological solution, mm. not uh, a psychotherapy solution. So sure. uh, we, we are background of neuroscientists and all. And what we knew was, um, through acupuncture actually, mm. is that core nerves that lead directly to the center parts of your brain will drive endorphin production and uh, balance the fight or flight part of your nervous system, the part that tells you run, you're gonna die. Right. Well, these are two core areas that needed addressing to address withdrawal, and we saw in acupuncture that they were having a lot of success. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you do electroacupuncture, they had even better success. And so we were looking in this area of what we call auricular neurostimulation, auricular being the ear. Sure. And how do we tap into the vagus nerve and trigeminal nerve? And when you tap into these nervous structures, there's all kinds of benefits. In fact, there's so many benefits, it seems ridiculous because you're like, well, it reduces inflammation, it improves cognitive function, it takes away PTSD. You well, start you start naming all these and it's like, and, and it balances your checkbook or something <laughs> like that. Right, like, right. You hit a point, you're like, this is too many. But the vagus nerve hits the heart, uh, the, the brain, it's called the wandering nerve, goes through the whole body. Wow. So my two partners, the smart ones, the scientists, sure. uh, they have been working in this field specifically in trigeminal nerve and uh, vagal nerve stem for years. Mm. And we kind of, we came across this and it was a perfect marriage of um, a very short-term fast-acting effect which for a company going through the FDA, do I want to do something that I got to prove it improves you over a year or over five days? I want something fast. Right. Uh, the effect was profound and very repeatable. Uh, you, I've worked in areas where everything was a little softer, like what's your pain score, one to 10, or, or, or uh, how depressed are you, one to 10? Those are very <laughs> subjective. This was, you stopped sweating, you stopped running to the bathroom every mm. five minutes, and you calmed down, and your heart rate balanced out that we can measure within 30 minutes. Wow, very So it was very, very profound. Yeah. And so it was sort of a combination of that, and then we said, but is there a market for it? And I was like, yeah, there's a, uh, unfortunately there's a giant epidemic. Uh, little did we know at the time, though, that I kind of, that's our beachhead. Yeah. So the beachhead was withdrawal, um, it was the fastest path through the FDA. It was the most profound effect. But then, really, the overall goal has always been to be a recovery tool for long-term addiction recovery. Mm. So after you get through withdrawal, and what we're starting clinical trials on, is can we manage your cravings, your depression, your anxiety, the triggers for relapse, and actually curve fix the curve and start to bend the curve of addiction in America. Now that is always combined with somebody on the psychology side. We're the biology side sure. and there needs to be a psychology partner, someone trained in addiction medicine that is counseling them through this process. Right, and is that, um, you know, when you're developing the product, uh, that psychoanalysis angle, is that coming from internally within Spark Biomedical? Are you partnering with other agencies? How do you, how do you balance those two aspects as you're developing your methodologies? Yeah, we are not in uh, the, the psychology side of it sure. all. So we, we partner, so you'll have um, a, a behavioral health center that has a, a physician that is certified in addiction management and they would prescribe the device mm. and oversee them. So we're partnering all over the nation with uh, those individual rehab facilities right. and, and telehealth docs that do this and everything. Nice. I think we'll probably do some follow-up episodes on those partnerships too and how they elevate the quality and efficacy of the product. Uh, but speaking of, uh, excuse me, of efficacy, uh, 
let's talk on developing the solution in the first place. Can you walk us through the clinical trial process? You mentioned it was the fastest path through uh, the FDA, getting FDA uh, clearance and approval. So walk us through that clinical trial to develop the needed results to make a case to the FDA. What were some of the things that you saw during that trial that stood out to you? And walk us through the methodology of the process, too. Yep. Well, we found it, when we found this company, we said we're going to be a company based on good science. Mm. Um, when you have two partners that are PhDs in neuroscience, it's pretty, you know, that's, that's, <laughs> that's easy to start. say. It's a good yeah, right. start. <laughs> um, and this space is traditionally full of uh, less than adequate science, hmm. unfortunately. Uh, there's a lot of people who do studies, and they, there's a lot of rehab facilities that say they have 80% success rate, and they have 15% success rate. Hmm. There's a lot of charlatans out there. Now, I'll pause here before you continue. What, why is that? Why do we see that phenomenon? Money. <laughs> I mean, it's recruiting, right? If, yeah. I, if you're trying to figure out which rehab facility you check yourself into, the one that says, you know, 90% of our patients, one and done, and the one, the other one goes, 90% of our patients do this four or five times. Like, which one are you? The one's telling you the truth, and one's telling you what you want to hear. Right. So, and then there's just a lot of bad science. Um, there's a lot of good science, too, but there's a lot of bad science. Uh, so we went about this. We built uh, a randomized control trial, which means you have a control arm, you have a sham arm. You prove there's no placebo effect, which we did. Nice. Uh, we had multiple measurements. Uh, we're the only company ever to study this where we measure withdrawal on something called the CAL score, okay. Clinical Opioid Withdrawal Scale. And it has 11 individual points of measurement to measure withdrawal. Okay. We captured every single one of those from yawning to pupil dilation to goosebumps, gastric distress, mm. anxiety, achy bones. It has the whole, whole slew. We captured every single one of those individual markers, hmm. 30 minutes, 60 minutes, an hour and 20 minutes, day one, day two, day three, day four. We captured depression scores and PTSD scores as secondary measures, wow. which showed significant improvement. And so, and then we had, like I said, wrap this all in an FDA compliant uh, uh, structure. All the data was electronically captured and managed. So I kind of go on and on, but it was, we, even though we we're a tiny new company, we did this as if we we're a Fortune 500 company. This is how they would run a clinical trial. Yeah. And we're very proud of it. Uh, that rigor uh, has um, really behooved us. We've gone on and run a baby trial for babies born dependent on opioids. Wow. Yeah. That's in development. Uh, and then that has uh, amazingly got us two, two and a half million dollar grants from the Nat National Institute of uh, Drug Addiction wow. Uh, wow. to further our technology. So it played out the way we had hoped it was, sure. which is if you do it right and you do it with good rigor, that you will give yourself a much longer runway and that we're not trying to just one and done and get our FDA approval and then sell. It's There's a whole lot, a whole lot of work to do to get this, a real comprehensive holistic solution to market. My grandpa always used to say, make your bed right the first time or you have to make it twice, right? And so yep. it, that rigor of leaning in to it, almost capturing every metric that you find relevant to make your pitch and make your case, uh, I feel like that is the right kind of mentality for something like this where you need to be reactive, you need to be proactive, and that includes understanding the full scope of what does addiction look like? What does relapse look like? What does treatment look like? And producing a solution that tackles the minutia as well as gives tools to uh, you know, tackle the, the larger picture, the, the psychoanalysis picture too, it, it's all uh, a needed strategy. And so it's, it's really great to see that you put that rigor in to start. But I also want to highlight the speed of the process. I mean, the fact that you went from concept testing to FDA clearance and sales in the span of 18 months, is that is that accurate? Two, two years. Two years? Okay, yeah, yeah, cool, yeah. cool. Two years, and we'll give you 24 months. That's still fast. That I mean, fast. Yeah, that's fast. So and it's incredibly impressive, especially because the quality did not suffer because of speed, right? So I'm, I'm curious, you know, even though you moved fast, something as impactful as addiction treatment technology needs to be developed thoughtfully, obviously. So what did it take for you to build that product and get it through the FDA? I'm sure all of that rigor 
helped make that process easier, but how did that connect to speed, right? How did you actually, I don't know, yeah. leverage your resources like a pharmaceutical giant would, but you know, you're a small <laughs> company. Um, well, my first timeline said one year, so I missed it by 100%. Oh. <laughs> so, um, it, which I mean, was completely, <laughs> completely unrealistic. And uh, I look back and go, that never would have happened. Um, so we set out and hired and brought on a team of experienced people. So okay. almost all of us, in fact, all of us in the early days had 15 to 20 years in NeuroSTEM and had been building these devices. Uh, and um, my founding partner, Alejandro, actually built the original device in his garage. He was going after uh, migraine okay. uh, pain. So you stemming back here on the occipital nerve for migraines. So he had an earlier prototype, had thought through this in the early days himself. Hmm. So we he thought through some of the technology. So when we hit the ground running, we were decisive. Uh, we knew what we were going to build. We certainly had a lot of discoveries. Uh, but we brought on people that all specifically hit the ground running, and so there was it wasn't like, hey, how are we going to put an FDA compliant quality system? Is and he was like, nope, we've done this, we've done this multiple times. Uh, we we spent money smartly where we needed to. That you know, it could be cheap, you can be smart and done with your money. And there's certain things that are a waste. Certain things it was like, just pay for the pay for it to be done right the first time and go. Uh, we also had a good. A design partner with a company out of Houston called Valentium hmm. uh, that did a lot of our engineering, um, and so it was it was just really. Um, I tried to be an entrepreneur when I was younger. Yeah. It didn't go well. I, I didn't have twenty, but I, I was I didn't have a network of people, and I didn't have twenty right. years experience in an industry. So this time around, it was. I, I had a Rolodex of people, and so did my other partners. And call, and then, the, and then the other half of it was serendipitous. COVID hit, and then companies kept laying off really good people, and so we were able to hire really good talent. And it'd be like you just laid off uh, a, a veteran of operations of you know of twenty years that's you know built everything. It's like hey, come on, yeah. and by the way, he's got six months severance, so he's going to cut me a, a break on salary for a while from the other guy. So we had a bunch of really. It was it was a uh, serendipitous hires yeah. that uh, other companies foolishly panicked during COVID, and we we were able to hire people and give them benefits in the middle of the pandemic, which was great. Definitely, yeah. I mean the the fact that you were able to leverage those resources you had built over the years is is key. And like I mentioned earlier, I think we'll probably end up doing some conversations with partners in the future to understand those relationships a little better what it took to help develop this product, and also just get their perspective on the entire crisis. Um, but to that point, uh, you know, choosing the right partner means having a personal set of standards, too, as a company. So how did you maneuver setting those standards individually, but then also communicating that across the company, whether that is to the hiring manager helping make these big hires, or whether that is to... Um, you know, basically just up, up and down the chain is what I'm trying to say. Uh, what standards did you set for yourselves to reach this vision of quality, uh, you know, patient-centered design and building out a company that can center that thoughtfulness and day-to-day -day activity? Yeah, I, it, was, it, wasn't, it was sort of intentional. I sure. mean, we, we spent time up front. Uh, we, when we first got the company going and had a couple people on board, we did a, a retreat uh, oddly enough, at a place called Sparrow Ranch, which we ended up naming the product Sparrow. Nice. Not related at all. <laughs> we just someone went, hey, didn't we go to Sparrow Ranch? <laughs> um, and we got whiteboards, and we spent two days, and we outlined our values and how we wanted to treat each other. We'd all been part of big corporations that just threw their people away. Mm. Um, I survived seven layoffs at one company before I was finally like, I, I just can't stand watching people's careers be ruined. Um, and in the and and then just watching the destruction to the business for chasing the quarterly numbers for right. the stock market, I would say also a big influence in this was Simon Sinek and mm -hmm. his uh, advice. And one of the things he he said in one of his speeches that I thought is like, treat your people your people come first, and then they'll take care of the customers and they'll take care of the shareholders versus shareholder supremacy, which is almighty dollar. We got to put the money up and we got, we got to make decisions specifically for the shareholder. Right. So we definitely treat our people like they come first. Mm. I think they know they do. I, I, I'd like to believe they know that every day and that we choose them over even the customer, but only in the sense of 
if we take care of them, they'll take good care of the customer. It just it just trickles up maybe versus yeah. down. I don't know how it works. Yeah. Um, and and I would say I couldn't be have two better partners to go on this journey. It was the perfect match of of three individuals who really just trusted each other, whose personalities get along. Yeah. Uh, one's a scientist, one's an engineer, and I'm the business guy. So we no one was stepping on each other's toes, nice. and we were just trusting each other. And that that core nucleus is is really, I I couldn't recreate it. It's lightning in a bottle. Yeah. We we were lucky to have met each other, and 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 the rest is you know just been a the best part you know the best partnership. Right. Well, then let's uh, get an assessment of how things have been going. Then you know since launch and maybe over the last year or so, how have things been going? Um, you know, give us a quick update on the sort of connections you've been making, the sort of success that uh, your methodology and your product has had, uh, and then if there was anything specific that you had to consider during launch to set yourself up for where you're at now. Yeah, so we we've been on market about six months, nice. and uh, the biggest thing challenge when you're launching a new disruptive technology is. Well, it's it's good and bad. It's new and disruptive, and and you get to define the narrative. And you're not just a me too trying to compete with somebody, but sure. but then you're asking individuals to change how their business works. Right. Uh, through this whole process, COVID has never been a problem to this company mm. until we launched, and we didn't realize this. And what we found was, as we go out to these residential facilities where they're treating people, they're all understaffed. They all have high turnover. And they don't have time to onboard new technology very easily. Mm. Uh, so that has probably been one of the bigger challenges. The successes, though, have been, I mean, we're wildly um, wildly successful where we're, we are getting in and people have time to integrate. Uh, we have just great patient stories left and right of, of how um, just profound uh, the device can be to someone's life. Yeah. Uh, we were recognized with these two new grants, which were awesome. So we continue to have some real good accolades. Love that. But as a business, uh, one of the dangers is trying to scale before you're ready, before you nail the business model. Like, what is the like? How how does how do we integrate this into our practice? Right. And so what we don't want to do is is like here buy buy my widget, you know. And you're just it's no. I'm <laughs> what I'm doing is putting a, a new. Uh, process and program in your facility to tr help you treat your patients. So we right. treat it like we're deploying and integrating a new port of the business versus saying, here's a stack of inventory, let me know when to reorder. Right. Which and means like developing a strategy that isn't just product development, but it's, it's in it, I mean, you're basically an integrator, you have to develop the training strategy, you have to develop the thoughtfulness to connect the dots for the clients. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and we have yeah. an incredible training program that mm. I, is better than when I was at a Fortune 500 company. We have training videos and modules, and we, we track everything for the, when we're bringing a facility on board. Right. And then we have, we've cleverly named uh, the integration plan is called the Sparrow Flight Plan. Nice. And so we come in with the flight plan and customize it. Uh, I, I think I'll homogenize down into, instead of fully customized for every facility, it'll probably one day be like, there's probably three or four major models and we'll be quicker at identifying them. Sure. So that's where we are, just uh, we're perfecting the business model, the sales model, logistics and shipping. Everything yeah. was manual, you know, like email says, hey, ship a product here, yeah, to, right. <laughs> to now actually a database and a customer relationship management system. Uh, and we didn't spend any money on those systems before FDA approval. Nice. Because if you don't get FDA approval, all that money would have been wasted and we would have needed it. And, and you just don't know with the FDA sometimes. So yeah. we really had to build all those systems from scratch since mm. we got the FDA approval in January. I mean, the fact that you're already finding this much success and you're still, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, six months is not that long, right? But you're already developing a, a great footprint. You're leveraging those resources and contact to identify you know, the right way to develop this integration. I mean, it sounds like the pieces are moving in the right direction. They are. Yeah. They are. Which is Never exciting. fast enough. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Ne never hitting that 12-month uh, no. goal, right? Uh, we miss every timeline I put out. <laughs> but, hey, better to miss a timeline and still be setting you know, what feels like a record, right? Or just at least setting a, a, a standard of quality. So it's, it's exciting. And we have a dedicated team. They're just yeah. crushing it. Totally. I love that. 
Well, I think that just about wraps up our conversation for today, so I'll leave you with one last question for our audience at home, uh, or in the office if you're watching in the office. Is there one action that you think people can really take away from today's episode, uh, if they're a professional in the industry on really any side of this crisis? Uh, you know, what can we leave them with as we continue our conversations and as we continue to rethink how to approach the op opioid, excuse me, epidemic um, you know, from the ground up? Yeah, I think just my own journey of discovery that there are, you know, a, a true compassion needs to be out there, but there are options and hope. Yeah. And, and that if you uh, or anyone you know are, are suffering from this, uh, reach out, and if they want to reach out to us for our product or physicians, we have a, a doc finder. We also have clinical literature that they can download and information. Nice. Uh, but outside of Spark, which Spark's just one little piece of the overall solution, I think it's if you know someone have compassion, you're not going to fix them, and if you're not trained in addiction medicine, don't try to advise them, but, but have compassion and support their journey. I love that. Centering the human empathy, that's important. And it's, uh, it's, it's the core of it. So the fact that you're really centering that as the whole ethos of the company, I think is going to lead you all to, to success here. So oh, thank you. I'm excited to be a part of it. I'm excited to continue these conversations with y'all. But till then, we'll go ahead and wrap up this first episode. So thank you, everyone, for listening to the very first episode of Vital Spark. Again, a Spark Biomedical podcast. And Daniel, if folks want to find out more about uh, your solutions, your services, your thought leadership, or they just want to get in touch in general, how can they do so? Uh, we, you can put your information in at our website at sparkbiomedical.com. Uh, and then we have social media, mainly like LinkedIn and all has a lot of our activity. If you just want to follow us, hit a little like when we post, you know, to Love helps that. get that algorithm running oh, so yeah. that more people can uh, find us who, who need to find us. A little social media validation. Never heard nobody. Uh, right? Always. Love it. All right, Daniel Powell, CEO and one of three co-founders of Spark Biomedical. Thank you so much for joining us. It's really been a pleasure getting to chat today. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in to this first episode of the podcast. If you like what you heard and saw today and you want future episodes, you want to make sure you're all caught up on our thought leadership, uh, or you just want to tap into some more expertise from the Spark Biomedical team, make sure you're heading to our website, sparkbiomedical.com, as well as subscribing to Vital Spark on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I'm your host, Daniel Litwin, the voice of B2B, and we'll catch you on the next episode of Vital Spark.